Well, welcome to uh, session two of this topic called the death of discernment. In our first session, we looked at the age of apostasy, and admittedly, it uh, ends uh, as it's meant to with some quite disturbing revelations concerning uh, the condition not only of the world in the end time, but the infiltration and influence that invades the church during the final age of the church before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, in this second session, we're going to give the response to that, and I've entitled this, The Antidote for Apostasy. Now, as we pointed out in our first session, there are a number of places in Scripture that make it quite clear that one of the signs of the end times will be that of apostasy within the church. We begin in Matthew chapter 24, verses 11 and 12, where Jesus says, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And so they will not only uh, be deceiving, they will be drawing people away. And the love that they previously had or the expression of love that they were showing toward perhaps the true and living God, that has grown cold. We also find in Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. And so, of course, we dealt with that in our first session and showed that this is where we get the whole title of, uh, that we use of apostasy. The Greek word uh, there, uh, instead of falling away, could also be apostasy. Uh, the apostasy will come first, and the, then the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. And of course, we have Paul's final warning to Timothy, as recorded in his second epistle to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, where he says, Now the Spirit expressly says in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And so as we concluded our first session, uh, I intentionally left it uh, in a place where you're confronted with the problem. And so we're left with a question, is there an antidote for apostasy? Uh, is there something we can be doing about this? Well, one of the things that happens to people when they become aware of this uh, pathetic and prophetic fact concerning the last age of the church, there can be a response where you find yourself wanting to withdraw. And I have met people who, uh, when they begin to consider the sense of uh, the uh, uh, false practices and heresy that seems to be pervading uh, so many corners of church gatherings worldwide, there can be that sense of drawing back. But let me begin by saying, the first solution is not withdrawing from fellowship. In fact, the opposite is true. In Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 23, the writer of the Hebrews says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, so as much the more as you see the day approaching. And so the writer to the Hebrews here is encouraging us that as we see the day approaching, we shouldn't be separating and isolating ourselves for fear of being around or associated or even viewing something that, that we believe is heretical. What we need to understand is we need to therefore seek fellowship of like-minded people who have a high view of Scripture, who hold it as authoritative and inspired by God, who, who want to see uh, the serious study of the Bible. And so stay connected. That's an important thing for us to do. The second thing is we need to stay sharp. Uh, as Paul was writing to the Thessalonican church, they were a church in which he only ministered for a few weeks, and yet they had serious questions and difficulties that they then sent messengers probably down to him uh, in either Athens or uh, Corinth, and he responded to them with these two epistles. They were having difficulty. 
And he gives them some pithy yet connected advice in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 19. There we read, Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now, those are not isolated thoughts. So often, when you find yourself questioning Uh, some aberrant theology or some strange practice that doesn't seem to be biblical, how often the purveyors of that doctrine or those who are practicing those things that are not necessarily uh, uh, underpinned from Scripture, they will say, whoa, be careful, brother. You don't want to quench the spirit here. Or, hey, man, you know, We want prophecy to flow, so don't you come along and begin to say, excuse me, that's in contradiction with what the Bible says. How can you be a prophet of God and say that which is contradictory to the Bible? Well, notice the whole package is what is being presented here by Paul. He says, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Instead, test all things. Hold fast what is good. And the result of that is to abstain from every form of evil. So, in other words, I believe the way we quench the Spirit is by not testing that which is false. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Paul tells his young disciple Timothy, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, in the King James Version, of course, uh, that term, uh, be diligent, is study to show yourself approved. Why the difference? Well, the Greek word that is used there, translated in the version I'm using, which is the New King James, the the Greek word used there really is something of intensity. It means to hasten, utmost, to exert oneself, endeavor, to give diligence. And that's why the King James, I think, perhaps in this instance, is really right in saying, study to show, be diligent. Uh, to present yourselves approved to God. It's not something that's going to just happen naturally as we lie back. It's something that we need to apply ourselves to. We also know that we not only need to stay in fellowship, uh, we need to stay sharp, but we need to stay on target. It's so easy to be derailed and go after all kinds of spurious things You know, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 really lays uh, the challenge before all of us. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, he says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And perhaps... In one sense, one of the ways in which we can find where our heart is, is to see where our treasures are. What are the things that we consider precious? Well, certainly that which is eternal should be precious to us, but are we investing in that? Notice we are told to lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven. How do we do that? Well, Paul writes Timothy and says, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Three things, reading, exhortation, doctrine. And then he goes on to say in verse 14, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those that hear you. And so, yet again, as with our session one, now in session two, we see Paul not only identifying the problem to young Timothy, but also the solution that we are to give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine, and to meditate on these things, giving ourselves entirely to them. We are to be diligent in in the study of the Word of God so that we can show ourselves as a workman who need not be ashamed. Now, as with session one, we want to look at the 
historic models that are laid out before us. For when we look at the response of Hosea, who is prophesying over Israel at a time of their apostasy, in Hosea chapter 6, we read, Come, let us return to the Lord, for He has torn, but He will heal us. He has stricken, but He will bind us up. After two days He will revive us, and on the third He will raise us up, that we may live in His sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning, and He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. Now, as we review this, we see that the antidote to apostasy at the time of Hosea was very simple. One was return to the Lord. The second is to pursue the knowledge of the Lord. How do we do that? Well, of course, we have the Bible. We study the Bible. But why study the Bible? Well, we learn from Psalm 119 many things. But one thing for sure, beginning in verse 9, we know that the Bible teaches us how to please God. Now, there are many other reasons why people will look into the study of the Bible. But it's important for us to understand the primary reason for studying the Bible is to understand who God is and how we should be in our response to God. Beginning in verse 9, we read in Psalm 119, How can a man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches." How do you please God? Well, one Psalm 119 says is that you do so by paying attention to the statutes of the Lord. Those are his commandments, the judgments, the judgments of God, both the rewards and the punishments. Don't think of judgment just in the sense of punishments, but there's judgments which provide reward, testimonies, biblical examples, precepts, which are the doctrines, ways which are the directions we should follow, the statutes according to His will, uh, protection, His word, instruction. So many things through Scripture can help us to understand how to please God. And so why do we study the Bible? First and foremost, we study the Bible to learn how to please God. In other words, how to understand the truth so that we can respond through the empowered presence of the Holy Spirit to the truth. Secondly, though, in the context of these two studies, we learn how to combat and offset false doctrine, which, according to the parable of the, the wheat and the tares, false doctrine is that seed that yields the fruit of apostasy. In other words, we study not only how to please God, that is how to understand truth, but we learn how to combat false doctrine, which is how to defend the truth, make a stance for truth. Now, we see that combating false doctrine is not simply for a select few who decide to sort of uh, weigh into uh, the battlefield, as it were, concerning uh, the importance of biblical doctrine. We see that it is a charge given to all Christians. Paul, writing Timothy, says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and at His kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Please notice here that he is told to convince, rebuke, and exhort. Now, those in many circles are considered terms of confrontation and conflict. And most people, when you are dealing with this issue 
of false doctrine and apostasy, they become squeamish. They begin to say, oh, we don't want to be divisive here. Uh, we, we want to be seen for what we believe in and not what we stand against. But that's not the biblical response that the New Testament gives us. We're not to sort of have a soft backbone, as it were, concerning false doctrine. We're to stand against it. We are to be ready in season and out of season. In other words, ready all the time to not simply go go with the flow so that you can make everybody happy and pleased with you, but rather he tells Timothy to convince, rebuke, and exhort. You know, there were those who came to Jesus and wondered at his ministry. And he said, look, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. In fact, we're told in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians that the, of all of the combat equipment that we have in spiritual warfare, that the word of God is the, is the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. And that we need to appreciate the fact that it divides between Uh, the um, uh, soul and the spirit and 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 not that we are to go around and, and and try to bludgeon one another that's not the point notice that we are to convince rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and teaching taking time to bring the person who is in error into a state of correct understanding now there are some who practice this uh, so-called uh, discernment ministries, who uh, their, their method of uh, identifying what they consider aberrant theology or, or wrong practices is like an individual who, who uh, rolls into a, somebody's house, pulls the pin on a grenade and rolls it through the door and, and just creates havoc. They, they, they look to, to bring about mayhem. Rather than we are instructed here that we are to convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching that we are to go with love. Love is uh, the long suffering is associated in one Corinthians chapter thirteen, an attribute of love, and so we should go with love and teaching. But our method, especially with regards to false doctrine, is that which some see as causing conflict, as it should. Why? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. It's so Paul really lays it out there for him. It says you'll endure affliction as you begin to do this, as you make a stand for what is biblically true and right. And the practices that are true and right, you will uh, suffer affliction as a result of it. But you are to be watchful in all things and that you are to fulfill your ministry. Now, when we consider this warfare, of course, one naturally thinks of the teaching that Paul gives the Ephesian church and recorded in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in in verse 13. There we read, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the day of evil, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having gird your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so there Paul gives the whole outfit uh, that we should adorn ourselves with and we should be familiar with as we enter into this spiritual warfare. And the spiritual warfare is not some airy fairy thing out there uh, in the uh, untouchable uh, cosmos that we should concern ourselves with. It's that which in most instances presents itself through another individual. It's interesting to note in the New Testament that when you look at satanically influenced obstruction to the preaching of the gospel, in almost all instances, it happens identifiably through individuals. In some instances, even demon-possessed. But they are individuals who are there to obstruct the preaching of the gospel. And it is through... Uh, the use 
uh, of the, uh, these instruments uh, and protections that allows us to be successful uh, in the spiritual realm in this warfare. Now, when we consider studying the Bible, there are many different methods being practiced today. Indeed, I think uh, there are different models that people choose to follow. But let's first of all, rather than examine all of those and filter our way through and see which one sort of suits us, let's see what examples we can find in Scripture. First of all, we see the Apostle Paul, truly the most prolific writer in the New Testament as as far as that which is canonized into the New Testament. In Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 18, we have him standing before the Ephesian elders. And we read, And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you. Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And so Paul stands before these elders and he declares something that they should all be familiar with by this time. His ministry there exceeded three years. Uh, It's the longest period recorded uh, uh, ministry uh, settled in one area for the Apostle Paul. And he tells them that he taught them publicly and from house to house and he declared to them the whole counsel of God. This pattern of Paul is is something that he reiterates even when he writes his epistle to them in Ephesians chapter 4. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And so Paul talks about the whole package of ministry that Christ gave to the church and the various individuals who would primarily carry out that ministry and what its benefit would be. Now, how is this equipping accomplished that he speaks of in Ephesians 4, uh, 12? How is this unity established that is spoken of in Ephesians 4, verse 13? Or this perfection apprehended, which is spoken of also in verse 13? Well, in Acts chapter 20, verse 20, as he stands before the Ephesian elders, he tells them, Paul taught them publicly and from house to house. The ministry of teaching is what he is referring to here. And what did he declare? He declared to them the whole counsel of God. Now, I take that to mean the entirety of Scripture. So, when we are speaking of Bible study, it's not simply taking a favorite verse and having an an open discussion about it. Uh, some of these home Bible studies turn into sort of share your own ignorance. They, they take a, a particular passage of Scripture and they want to go around the room and, and find out uh, uh, what the take is of everyone in the room. Now, that can be interesting and it can involve people and it can be very exciting to do, but it's also very dangerous because at the end of the day, um, no Scripture is of any private interpretation. We need to understand that Uh, that correctness is important. And so although fellowship around the word is important, we need to make sure uh, that we are rightly dividing the word of truth as Paul had instructed Timothy. Now, 
when you consider this idea of Bible study and Bible teaching, of course, if you approached any Christian minister of Jesus Christ, they all think they do it, and to some degree they do. But there are three major forms of Bible teaching, and they all have their place. The first type of Bible teaching is probably the most prevalent. It's what's referred to as teaching from the Bible. It's the most common form of explanation found in the church today. It's generally topic or thematic. And basically these two sessions on the death of discernment uh, would fall under the category of teaching from the Bible in that sense. It's topical, it's thematic. It's also the basis of systematic theology where effectively the Bible is used as a resource library and you start with a statement or a topic and search the scriptures to back up your presupposition. And so, uh, you know, they'll, they'll make a, a doctrinal statement or they'll make a, uh, an observation and they use the scripture to, to back their particular point of view. And of course, the, the downside of systematic theology is you can have wildly different conclusions all coming from the same book. And that's what we see so often within the church today. People who have studied the various forms of systematic theology find themselves not being unified by Scripture, but using Scripture to separate themselves from one another because they're embracing that which uh, supports their particular view and turning a blind eye to that which might call their view uh, into question. And so that's the downside of just simply teaching from the Bible with, uh, from the position uh, that um, you're going to start with an idea and use the Bible sort of uh, as, as a resource uh, book to accomplish that. The second type of teaching is teaching about the Bible, and this uh, sort of falls into the category of historic uh, surveys. Now, I'm not talking about summaries of the Bible in terms of the content and its doctrine, but rather it, where, where people are doing overviews and they're almost looking at the Bible as a series of stories without teaching the truths of the Bible. You see, I think there is a place for summary, for overview, very helpful, gives you a sense of perspective, but we need to go beyond just that of teaching stories and teaching, and teaching truths. The third form of Bible teaching is what I'm going to call teaching the Bible, and the emphasis is on teaching the whole of the Bible. You know, again, from session one, we made reference to both Hosea prophesying to the northern uh, nation of Israel during its time of apostasy uh, and Jeremiah during the southern uh, nation of Israel during its time of apostasy, both of them indicting uh, the people there, especially the leadership, that they had moved away from the feeding and caring of the people, moving them away from the fountain of living waters and hewing out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, which can't hold water. Well, Hosea gives, again, a remedy to the problem. He says, he, he describes the problem by saying, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. When we look at the history of Israel, Israel's revivals that take place always have at the center of the revival a renewal of the following of the commandments of God. It's interesting to also study the revival that takes place under Ezra the priest. He was the one who came back from the captivity in Babylon and reestablishes uh, a rebuilt uh, temple there in Jerusalem. Nehemiah records in chapter 8, now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of the men and the women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then they read it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. 
And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed down their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Interesting posture at this point. We're told in Nehemiah 8 that they built actually a pulpit of wood for him to stand uh, so that he could be viewed by the people. He brings the law out, and as he does so, uh, he blesses the people, and they say amen. But notice their worship. It wasn't some sort of wild party that happened at this point. It was worship that came from a heart that was pierced with a knowledge that they are before a holy God. Their worship caused them in this incident to bow their heads rather than raise their hands. They, they lifted up their hands while they said, Amen, Amen, but while they worshiped the Lord, their faces were to the ground. So there's great reverence going on here. And then we are told that the Levites went out among the people and helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place so they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. As these Levites moved out among the people, Ezra is reading. The Levites are going out, and they're saying, do you understand what you're hearing? If not, let's read it again. As you're reading, let's give the sense of it. That's the context and the understanding. And then give the understanding of the reading. You know, home Bible studies are great things. I've made reference to the style of home Bible study where really they just turn into a sort of a free-for-all of everybody sharing their opinion. And oftentimes, uh, those certainly can get derailed and, and even hurt people's feelings as there's different opinions expressed. Some of the most successful home Bible studies that I've been involved in are when a group of people get together and just systematically read the Bible together. It wasn't that long ago that I sat with a home study and we just read through the book of 1 John. We met at another time and read through the letter of Paul to the Philippian church. And it's amazing how so many of the things that might come from a, por a question that might come from a portion of Scripture are resolved by the text itself. And that you get to the end and you find yourself feeling a sense of satisfaction because you've taken it all within its context. And so these people went throughout and helped people understand what was there. As Isaiah was prophesying over uh, uh, the southern tribe of Judah, he really indicts the nation of Judah. And by that indictment, we have a strong clue to what he was committed to. For in Isaiah chapter 28, beginning in verse 9, we read this. Whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? To those just weaned from milk? To those just drawn from the breast? For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. You know, when we consider what... Isaiah is saying here, you recognize that those who thought they were sophisticated also found themselves being unteachable. Isn't it interesting that in the ministry of Jesus Christ, as he was teaching, there were children there, and, he, he, and, and although the disciples wanted to sort of shove them off, he took them and brought them and said uh, that you need to be like one of these if you intend to enter the kingdom of heaven. That there needs to be that sense of, of expectation from God, where you are anxious to learn precept upon precept, line upon line, a little here, a little there. Now notice in both instances, both with Ezra, recorded by Nehemiah and Isaiah, the emphasis on what I would refer to as chapter by chapter and verse by verse study. Ezra read distinctly from the book and then the Levites gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. That's expositional teaching. Isaiah says that it should be precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. 
You know what the advantages are of that? Well, first of all, it, you, everything builds upon one another. Now, I've been teaching for uh, ex expositionally for more than 25 years. And I find it quite difficult when people ask me to come as a guest speaker because I'm used to taking teaching, uh, taking people through books of the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And so you have the advantage when moving to the next chapter of having the previous chapters as a foundation and the uh, previous books as a foundation. And so it's, it's so much easier as a teacher when you stand before an audience uh, and give a teaching where you don't know what basis or foundation the people have before you, it's much more difficult. And so both Ezra and uh, Isaiah show this style of expositional type teaching. Now, the advantages of teaching the Bible, I'm gonna, there are many. I'm going to list seven. I'm sure we could probably come up with 77. But just to sort of get the, the uh, mental juices flowing in the sense of, of what the potential here, we're going to go through seven to start you thinking in the lines of the advantage of just teaching the Bible, reading it in, in its entirety and teaching through the Bible. First of all, it always keeps the text within the context, and this is always a danger. You remember when Satan came to Jesus quoting scripture. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 4, verse, beginning in verse 5. We read, Then the devil took him up to the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And of course, Satan is quoting verbatim, Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. We read, Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And he quotes scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Well, let's take a look at the context of the scripture that Satan used. Because oftentimes, people who can be very convincing will use scripture. But they will use it out of context not only of the immediate text, but of course the greatest context is the whole counsel of God. And that's why Paul says before the Ephesian elders that in teaching house to house, he taught the whole counsel of God. Now let's take a look at Psalm 91 and see if we can see the context of all this. Beginning in verse 1, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. So notice, the condition of this promise is, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You see, Jesus identified the problem with Satan's use of Scripture. He was trying to tempt Jesus to move outside of what was the will of the Father for the Son. And though it sounded good, Jesus reminds him that we are not to tempt the Lord our God. And that we are not to be presumption. There is a big difference between presumption and faith. And you need to study carefully the difference one ends in reward, one ends in punishment. Presumption is not to be 
um, confused with faith. Presumption is where you believe God will honor you in doing what you think you should do. Faith is following God, what God is calling you to do. That's a simple definition, but go study it yourself a little more. You'll see that there's quite a difference between presumption and faith. Now, remember that a text without a context is a pretext. So I really steer away from what I call single verse theology. People who will, they have a particular verse that they just really zero in uh, on and, uh, and want to make a huge issue over. I'm always wary of those kinds of people because in that attempt, they are trying to draw you away from the whole counsel of God and what may be presented and might be feasible in one incident is not consistent elsewhere with scripture. And so we need to keep not only the text within the context in its immediate text, but also with regards to the whole counsel of God. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, So we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy neither came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. How important it is for us to understand that our opinions are of no value if those opinions lead us away from what God desires to reveal through His Word by the Holy Spirit. There's far too much opinion going on. Now, I think that you can have opinion so long as you clarify it as opinion. I think there are understandings of Scripture which we can have variation on. It's not clear. I can tell you this, though. In more than 35 years in full-time ministry, I can tell you this, that I've certainly seen certain ideas and concepts and doctrines that were teached 25, 35 years ago certainly have changed because as time has moved on, as uh, God has uh, moved upon the hearts of, of, uh, of good uh, Bereans to, to study the word. Uh, we are constantly finding ourselves uh, uh, discovering uh, new insights into scripture. And so, um, you know, when, when, when people ask me concerning uh, uh, some of my views on things, uh, if I detect that, uh, that they're uh, probing in an area where there uh, can be other opinions, I try to, to fairly uh, present uh, the other opinions, although I'll certainly try to persuade them that, to go along with mine. But understanding this important thing, understanding that uh, we only know in part uh, uh, really, we, we see through a glass darkly. We don't actually know everything. And, and it, it does surprise me that there are some people um, uh, sort of, <laughs> in one sense, uh, making merchandise within the church as though they know everything in perfection. And they are the, uh, the complete counsel of God in terms of uh, describing what is perfect doctrine. And uh, I'm always wary of those people because I certainly have changed many of my positions over time, things that I thought years ago uh, I don't longer teach now. And sometimes I wish I could go back and get some of those recordings and, and, uh, and, and get them out of circulation. But nonetheless, um, we, we all are learning as we go on. And so it, it is having that sense of, of awesomeness toward the, what the content of the Word of God is, but also recognize that we are frail and that we may come to wrong conclusions. And so we need to be open to the fact that we may need to readjust some of our positions. And I hope certainly, uh, I for one, uh, are, are able to do that when a better understanding or a better explanation comes along. And so uh, Peter's admonition there, certainly I take to heart, and I certainly trust you would take to heart also. 
The second advantage of teaching the Bible is that it demands exegesis rather than eisegesis. Now these are two terms associated with uh, hermeneutics uh, and it has to do with how you understand what the text is saying. Uh, exegesis is reading from the text, eisegesis is reading into the text. Now you all understand what that means if you have children. You know that um, uh, if your child comes to you and they say, Daddy, uh, can I do such and such? And you say, well, I'm not really sure, go ask your mother. By the time they get in the other room uh, to ask your wife, uh, they're saying, Dad says it's okay if it's okay with you. And surely that's the idea of eisegesis. That's not what I said. I said, go ask your mother. But they will read into it that which helps them in their particular position. That's why Paul tells Timothy to, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He uses a term there that really uh, describes a word picture of, a, of a, a person cutting a bolt of cloth. It is not just simply cutting it down the middle, it's cutting it so that it can be used to make something, rightly dividing the word of truth, recognizing that as we use the, the word of God, uh, which is uh, the sword of the Spirit, that we are dividing, it is divisive, it is something that separates truth from error. The third advantage of teaching the Bible is that it prevents what I call hobby horse type teaching. Paul again tells Timothy, beginning in chapter 4 of his second epistle, he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. You see, part of the problem of hobby horse type teaching is it is teaching to a theme which has ulterior motives like the individual who uh, he, you know, he is uh, with a group of people, a pastor perhaps, uh, he is presiding and working within a church that has a dilapidated old building, they'd like to get a building project going, they, they need some more uh, offerings, you know, <laughs> to come in, and of course he starts teaching through the book of Nehemiah, uh, and uh, he's going to really buttonhole the people with regards to the diligence of the people uh, having a trowel in one hand and a sword in another and, and rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And, and I'm not saying that he can't use that in a homiletical sense. Homiletics is the application of Scripture. But when you make that the primary focus of the Scripture, you're missing the point. You're missing the fact that it's broader than that. And especially where you find some people, they can find their favorite topic Almost any form, any place in Scripture, even if they have to, to twist the arm up the back and make it confess to anything, they will make the passage fit that. And that's what I call hobby horse type teaching. But when you are teaching through the Bible and teaching the whole Bible, you won't see that type of result. The fourth method of Bible teaching is that it causes us to examine all of Scripture. Paul writing to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 6, 16, says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Number five, teaching through the Bible gives us a balanced view of God's Word. You know, I have to admit, I, as a youngster, attended a church where I heard really three sermons over and over and over again. One was a sermon that was about salvation. The other was a sermon that had something to do with being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the third was the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
all very powerful sermons, but as far as I was concerned, that's all I heard every Sunday. And as a result of it, I found myself being driven to, to questioning my salvation almost every Sunday. And so just to make it sure, I would go down to the altar call uh, every Sunday. I'm, I, I, I quit many times when people say, when did you get born again? And I tell them, well, I was born again more than a hundred times because that sense of, um, of, um, of going and responding to that. And uh, it was amazing how uh, as I began to sit under the teachings of others who taught verse by verse, chapter by chapter, the whole Bible, how it gave balance to the whole uh, scripture and the whole Bible in itself. You know, when Paul writes to the Ephesians, he begins his letter to them in the first three chapters, speaking to them of the wealth of the believer. And then it's not until chapters 4 and 5 that he begins to talk about the walk of the believer, who we are in Christ, and what he's enabled us to do. And then finally, chapter 6, he talks about the warfare of the believer. Now, I can't tell you how many times I've been approached by people who ask me questions with regards to spiritual warfare, and they want to understand about the topic of spiritual warfare, and should we do this, and should we do that, and can demons do this, and can demons do that, and you know, should we put anointing oil over the door to our house as we go in each day, and so on and so forth, all these various practices. Well, I would rather take the position that Paul took with the church at Ephesus, that he labored with them, making sure they understood who they were in Christ and what he has done for them and how they are capable of walking in Christ. Then he tells them about spiritual warfare so that they are firmly planted upon the word of God. I've met far too many people that are out there uh, practicing all kinds of, um, uh, of, of things to try to deal with the, the or, or connect with, or something, the spiritual world around them, and concerning themselves with all kinds of matters, which in, in many instances are completely a waste of time. And in some instances, not even biblical. Because they haven't taken the time to understand who they are in Christ. And the authority they have in Christ and the protection they are promised by Christ, and the power of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, and how the enemy is not coming to them, but is encased in, in fortresses. For as Jesus spoke of the position of Satan against the church, he said to Peter at uh, Caesarea Philippi, that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. In other words, Satan is in the defensive position concerning the church and true born-again believers. But we won't appreciate what we are to do to advance the cause of Christ until we first understand who we are in Christ and how to walk in Christ. Then we can be uh, effective in the warfare on behalf of Jesus Christ. The sixth reason is you see Jesus in the whole of Scripture. You know, there's an interesting commentary given to us by Luke, Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 25. You're all probably pretty familiar with it. It's when after the resurrection, Jesus comes along, two individuals walking on the road to Emmaus. And he listens to their conversation, and he asks them, you know, why are they sad? And they give him sort of a, uh, a response of, man, where have you been? Are you unaware of what just happened down in Jerusalem? And then in verse 25, then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Oh man, wouldn't you love to have been a, 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 a fly on the wall, so to speak, a, a member of that uh, a Bible study. Notice where Jesus was preaching about himself. 
from the Old Testament. So many people today avoid the Old Testament. In fact, it's a it's sad term that we even call it the Old Testament. I had a situation one time in Scotland. We had a ministry team there. We were there for three weeks ministering on the streets. At night, we ran a sort of a coffee bar, and afterwards, we had a Bible study, and there was these young fellows that would come in each evening. They would stay around for the coffee bar, and after the second or third night, as soon as the Bible study started, I noticed three of them just ran out of the building, and I ran after them and uh, grabbed them, and I said, what's up? And they said, well, you know, we really enjoy talking to you guys. You're very interesting and whatever, but, you know, every night you end the evening studying from the Bible, and we just can't believe the Bible. And I said, why? And they said, well, because you had to rewrite it. And I pu was puzzled, and I thought to myself, what do you mean rewrite it? And he said, yeah, of course, you've got your Old Testament, and then you've got your New Testament. You see, that is the perception, strangely enough, of people, sometimes even within the church, that that which is old is not worth dealing with. In fact, the opposite is true. When Jesus was teaching during his ministry, he said, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Elsewhere in Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of the Hebrews says, in the volume of the book it is written of me. We need to appreciate there's an advantage in studying the whole of Scripture, not only to get the whole counsel of God, but the beauty in seeing Christ in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus. Oh, it's so exciting to see uh, types and shadows for, as is said, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. The doctrines of the New Testament, the key doctrines of the New Testament, have examples, as if it was a stage play, examples in the Old Testament. And the, the events in the Old Testament that are significant have doctrines in the New Testament that give you understanding as to what's going on there. So that's number six. Let's move on. Number seven. And we'll, we'll end with this, but as I said, there's loads that you could go on to here. It is the only logical way to read a letter or a book. Can you imagine if I wrote you sort of a three or four page letter, and after receiving it, some friends came over and they said, so what did Ron have to say? And you get out this three or four or five page letter, and you sort of look down it, and, and you sort of read one sentence. And you all sit down and go, wow, wow, that's really amazing. That really tells me a lot. Yes, of course, that's nonsense. I know of no person that would buy a novel. You know, you go into the store, especially I travel a lot, and people go into the airports, and they buy these whacking great big novels. And, and, and I'm always somewhat bewildered by that, that they will spend so much time uh, powering through all of these words. But I can't imagine someone buying a great big novel and then just simply flipping through it and reading a few bits and bobs here and there by chance uh, and then acting as though they have a sense or an awareness of even what's being communicated. And yet there are people today who have never devoted themselves to reading the whole Bible, finding out what the whole book has to say. They might listen to somebody who talks about the Bible discusses things from the Bible, but they don't actually read or are under the teaching of the Bible. It's the only logical way to read a letter. It's interesting. Paul, for example, as he writes his epistle to the Colossians, closes that epistle by saying this. Now, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And so, uh, apparently, there must have been an epistle from Paul to the Laodiceans. But notice what they instructed to do. Read the epistle. Read that, the whole epistle. You're not going to understand what he says to the Colossians unless you understand the whole of the epistle of the Colossians. And so, there is that advantage of teaching the Bible. It's the only logical way to, to understand from Genesis to Revelation this marvelous message that has been preserved for us so that we might know and understand what the word of God is so that we can be obedient to the will of God and follow the way that he has for us. You know, what is the antidote for apostasy? 
Well, in Luke chapter 13, verse 24, we are told that you must enter through the narrow gate. That's the first thing. Number two, you must pursue the knowledge of the Lord. That's Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. And finally, you are to do the will of the Father in heaven. You can't become a a member of the body of Christ and, and then expect to live a life in isolation from the head. You are by nature connected to the vine if in fact you have repented and believe in Jesus Christ as crucified for you and is now the risen Lord sitting at the right hand of the Father on high. And that by doing so, you receive the gift of the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And so with that, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your word and grateful, Lord, that you do tell us what we can do in this age of apostasy. Thank you, Lord, that we have a confidence that as we put our trust in you and that as we commit our eternal lives to you, that he who begun a good work in us will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for that confidence we have. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.